Um, so, uh, I went forever on that, but we did get into plot a little bit, which at least gives you some of the plot lecture. Um, I'm going to not talk about viewpoint because that would go too long. And I'm going to finish up um, talking about magic systems from last week, and then we'll be done and go to writing groups. All right? Um, so this, the reason I chose to do this lecture today is because this whole flaws and limitations things really is about how uh, a big part of how I develop magic systems. The second um, rule of magic I've given to myself. Again, these aren't like hard, fast rules. This isn't like I read a book and say, oh, they're breaking Sanderson's second law. This is a bad magic system. Um, these are rules I use for myself to help me make my magic systems more interesting and my stories more interesting. Um, second, um, Brandon's second law, Sanderson's second law, is that limitations are more interesting than the powers themselves. And this tends to be true. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, magic is an interchangeable technology. And like I said, this really kind of applies to a lot of things. For instance, I think that um, what is going wrong in your world is generally going to be more interesting than what's going right. Um, generally, the things your character can't do are going to be more interesting to your reader than the things they can do. The things they can do can still be very interesting. But the things they're not capable of doing are generally where your story lies. And so that's what people focus on. And so this is a greater storytelling thing. To go back to comic books, um, because uh, a lot of us have seen these movies, we go to Batman. The things that Batman can do are pretty cool. We like reading about them. But those don't make stories. The problems that the, when the, the villains play into Batman's like, issues, that's where a story comes from. And his flaws tend to be what drives our story. Um, the same thing happens with Superman. Stories in, um, um, in at least modern day Superman uh, tellings are not about Superman being able to fly. They're about someone has kryptonite, right? The flaws li and limitations are where your story generally happens. For your, what's that? I said he can't stop world hunger. Yeah, he can't stop world hunger. That's true. Um, uh, didn't he push an iceberg, fly an iceberg to, to Africa once or something like that, yeah. though? Yeah. So he stopped a drought. Um, so that was something. That was something. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let's get back to this with magic system. Um, good magic system, in my opinion, has limitations and, and, and flaws. Um, and I do divide these in my head, um, meaning you know, the, what the magic can't do and uh, what holes or problems there are in the magic. Like what, when you use the magic, what kind of problems does it cause? Um, and usually it should cause some sort of problem. Uh, this can be minor. It can be, yes, using the magic costs money and we don't have a lot of it. Um, or it can be the magic, uh, using the magic makes me very tired. And that's bad because then people can stab me. Um, that one is very, is a standby. I've used it myself. I encourage you to, to look beyond. Don't use that one too often. Uh, come up with interesting limitations. Orson Scott Card um, suggests one in his book that he ended up using, which is when you use the magic, someone close to you dies. Um, you know, it like kills one of your grandparents when you use the magic. Um, that's a pretty big flaw in the magic system. And you can only use it a limited number of times, um, usually when you're younger. Uh, <laughs> and things like that. Like it requires like some blood sacrifice or things like this. Um, you can go all sorts of directions with this, but coming up with interesting flaws and limitations to your magic system. Um, for me, a limitation is more like um, in the Mistborn series I wrote a telekinesis. You can move things with your mind. I put a limitation on it that says you can only move metals and they have to be directly away from you and, or pull directly towards you um, using vector physics, right? Uh, you know, mass versus mass and things like this. Uh, this limitation actually for me as a writer was the most fun thing about the magic system. I had seen telekinesis done a lot. Uh, Star Wars does telekinesis. Everybody does telekinesis. X-Men does telekinesis. And yet limiting it specifically to the pushing and pulling forced me to be more creative with how I used it, which in turn forced my characters to be more creative, which allowed the readers <coughs> to say, wow, that was clever what this character just did, which is different from this character can move things with their mind, and so they just move this, and it happens. You don't think, oh, that was clever. You think, OK, they did that. That's within their powers. That's good. Um, but when a character does something that 
that they use the limitations to their advantage or they work around them. It allows you to make the characters very capable. Um, and I've found more and more that what the magic can't do um, becomes more interesting than what it can do. And so, like we just talked about with characters, when you start developing your magic or your technology in your books, start asking yourself these limitations. What can't it do? And when using it, what does it cost? That's really, for me, like the flaw of the magic. It's, they're, they're different for characters and things, but what does is, what is that cost? Um, what does it do when you do it? Uh, other ways you can limit the magic are based on you know, how you get the magic. Uh, being born with it is, of course, the old standby. But if you aren't born with it, how you get it can be very interesting. If you have to kill somebody to gain their magical power, that's a very different story. Throws in lots of conflict, and it makes um, an interesting flaw slash limitation to the magic system, um, particularly if your character wants to have the magic, these sorts of things, or if the character has the magic, and people are hunting them down to chop off their head to get their share of it. Um, so it makes the magic more interesting, all right? So flaws versus limitations. We just had a whole lecture on this. I think you can probably apply that to magic. Um, the last one is the one I haven't come up with a, a pithy enough phrase for yet. Um, but the concept of the last law is that everything is interconnected. And a really good magic system, you're in, in a book with a really good magic system, your job as an author is to outthink the reader about the ramifications of that magic. All right? Readers who read science fiction and fantasy love interesting magics or technologies. They tend to like these things. But one of the reasons they read specifically science fiction is they want to see what ramifications, how the world would be different if this interesting technology existed. How would, um, how would cyberspace, if we could actually you know, upload our brains to, to, uh, to the computers, how would that change everyday life? And that's the thing you've got to ask yourself, and you've got to connect it to everything. A good magic system isn't just about magic. It involves economics. It therefore involves warfare, and it involves uh, how the governments relate to each other. Theoretically, a really good magic is going to have some sort of relationship and tie to the ecology of the world in which you're working. Um, and it's going to relate to the cultures, the religions, all of these things. Religion changes a lot when magic is real. Um, and your job is to extrapolate these things. In technology, how does a religion deal with technology? How does a religion deal with the fact that you could become immortal by uploading your brain to a computer? Do you still have a soul? Or did the soul die and this is just a copy of your soul? Interconnect these things. How do you do this with uh, more urban fantasy? Um, urban fantasy is a little bit tougher, simply because the world is going to be the same world. But you still want to ask yourself these things. Like, if you've got your main character, you're doing a Dresden Files sort of magic so sort of thing, let's say. Um, You've got a main character who's using the magic. What is their opinion on religion? Magic is real. Are devils and angels real? If so, how does that change their, um, their, their look at religion? How do people with magic, how have they influenced the economy? And you know, um, Harry Potter, they're like, well, they've got a bureau in the government that deals just with them. Um, Harry Potter um, does the normal thing of children's, which is with, with the secondary world, which is it really doesn't affect the real world. Um, you can get away with that depending on your genre. And in urban fantasy, you're probably going to have to. But readers are going to want to know how your interesting magic things affect the economy of the people who know about it. Can you pay someone to use this magic? If so, so how much does it cost? Um, this, is, this is a very, very big issue for storytelling. It doesn't exist in some of the other genres. For instance, in games, you don't have to worry about this. Um, if you're, you, know, you happen to be writing a video game, you don't ask yourself, man, these people can turn mud into diamonds. That would ruin the economy if, if diamonds are worth anything, wouldn't it? You don't have to worry about that in a video game. Yeah. Um, but in a book, you better ask yourself, if they can make diamonds, what are diamonds worth? And why would they be worth anything at all? Uh, what does it cost to make them? These sorts of things. You've got to be asking yourself that. So third law, good magic is interconnected with the world around it. And you have thought further than the reader in extrapolating the ramifications of that magic. And I want to let you go so that we have time. Um, I will have substitutes for you uh, the next two weeks, I think. Um, I might be back the third week. I don't know.